thank you for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me. So it's my uh, pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, Aaron Benanev, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Humboldt University, where uh, we are privileged to, to gather for this conference. Um, unfortunately, he's not able to be with us in pers uh, person today um, for extenuating circumstances, but we're really happy um, and lucky that he was still able to join us um, remotely. Aaron, um, recently wrote uh, a book on automation and the future of work, which has uh, a really interesting discussion on a post-scarcity society, which uh, I think everyone gathered here would be very uh, curious to learn about. It builds on um, work that he had done previously, including a series of uh, articles for the New Left Review. Uh, I won't um, take up too much of time because Aaron uh, has a presentation for us today about his book, uh, following which I will uh, ask a couple of questions uh, about the book and then open it up to the audience. So thank you again, Aaron, for taking the time to join us. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Is, um, I hope my audio is coming through OK. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to um, the book I wrote and, and talk to you a little bit about um, the theses and how they could inform social movements and activism within cooperative spaces today. So the book is about the rise of, um, just to give a very brief summary of some of the theses, the book is about the rise of a new automation discourse that talks about how uh, the new digital economy um, but especially new industrial robots and machine learning pushing towards artificial intelligence is just um, uh, uh, obliterating jobs already across the economy and that this is going to continue and um, get more extreme over time. Uh, and it, it's a story that um, is meant to explain some really stark features of the world over the past few decades. Um, it's meant to explain why uh, workers are so insecure why inequality is rising, and why um, these new tech billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk um, are not only so wealthy, but have become so powerful in shaping um, economic and political futures for society. Now, I think that you know, workers in the digital and platform economy, as well as supporters of them in the wider society, have often suspected that this automation discourse um, was a way not only of boosting the Silicon Valley elite, but also a way of uh, distracting us from the real working conditions in the platform economy. So if Uber drivers are about to be replaced by self-driving cars, then it kind of suggests that the drivers themselves as well as their supporters have no reason to organize and fight for better conditions. It's a hopeless task. Um, and my, uh, you know, I think workers have suspected and in the midst of the tech backlash that we're seeing, and also because self-driving cars turned out not to be such an immediate reality, um, we're seeing a lot of pushback against this tech narrative. And my book is, um, is a part of that pushback. My argument is that the suspicions that platform workers have that automation is not so quickly around the corner um, are correct. There is big changes in technology today and we can see that all around us. But um, the technologies that we're seeing are not the main force that's responsible for the growing insecurity that workers face and the rising inequality that's been reshaping our societies for decades. Um, the argument of my book, I'm not going to be able to explain in detail the reasoning, but the basic argument is that for a very long time, economic growth rates have been slowing down. We really live in an age of stagnating capitalism, and we have for a long time. It's really been since the 1970s uh, in the West and across many um, countries, even the global South since the 1980s. And even China now is starting to experience this um, significant slowdown trend. Uh, and the evidence that I bring out in the book shows that really it's not that technology-induced job destruction has been speeding up. That's the key idea in the automation story is that these technologies are spreading through the economy destroying all of these jobs much faster than jobs were destroyed in the past. What I show in the book is that really 
um, job destruction has not been accelerating. What's been, what's been happening is that job creation has been slowing down, and that's associated with this general stagnation trend in the economy. And a big part of the story, what this kind of alternative perspective helps us understand is um, how governments have been reacting over the last uh, 30, 40, or even 50 years. Governments have been reacting to the slowdown trend by doing everything that they can to revive the growth engine. And mostly what that's looked at is giving big handouts to the rich, including in the new newly emergent digital economy and making life much more insecure for workers. So repealing a lot of worker protections as well as um, not implementing environmental protections and really trying to push people, especially the unemployed or the new entrants into the labor market to take precarious and insecure jobs and of course, many of those are appearing um, within the platform economy. But none of these government efforts marked by kind of neoliberal reforms and austerity have done the job of reviving uh, economic growth rates. And so what we've seen instead are that economies have been suffering from um, rising inequality, workers are suffering from increasing insecurity, states have very high levels of debt, and um, we live in societies with crumbling infrastructure that has been buckling under the pressure, both of the COVID crisis and of the kind of wherever we are in this mid post COVID um, era, um, states and economies have just not been doing very well uh, under decades of stagnation in, in dealing with these problems. Um, and in the book, I kind of lay out all of this evidence, kind of criticizing the automation story and also contextualizing it in order to uh, say something about the real problems that our economy faces, um, where a lot of that, in my view, has to do with the uh, stranglehold that private investors have over the economy under these conditions of stagnation, their refusal to invest, the lack of opportunities that they see for investment um, is really at the core of um, our society's problems. And they explain both continued low growth rates in the economy and this kind of financialization of the economy. What's different about my view from some other views on offer, especially from different kinds of heterodox economists, is that I really think that these are deep structural problems, that the lack of investment and this kind of stranglehold on the economy um, that's resulted in high uh, insecurity for workers, continued government austerity, um, and slow growth and financialization, these are embedded in deep structural features of the economy. Um, and it's going to be very hard for capitalist economies to kind of get out of the rut that they are stuck in. And from that perspective, I'd be happy to talk about that in questions. Um, the book also lays out a critique of proposals for basic income, which are very popular in the space of uh, the automation discourse. The basic idea that the automation theorists are putting forward is to say something like, um, Look, you know, the economy is, 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 is growing beyond our wildest dreams. We're able to produce more and more stuff with robots and computers. Um, and, and the only problem that they say, these automation theorists say that the only problem we face is that people don't have enough income to buy all the things that we make. And from that perspective, it really seems like basic income could be the solution to our problems. My account is to show why I don't think basic income could really be such a silver bullet solution. Um, and the reason is that in my view, we aren't living in an age of incredible technological possibilities. There is technological change happening and it's changing all these different features of the economy, but it's not really generating the kind of cornucopia of productive possibilities that um, the automation theorists claim. On the contrary, I'm saying the economy has been slowing down and that's been generating this kind of permanent um, austerity trend. And in my view, because basic income is only a solution at the level of distribution, it doesn't affect this deeper core of problems in production, it's not going to be able to really change the trend in the economy. And so like all of these other welfare programs, Basic income, if it is implemented, is likely to remain at a low level, to not really be as helpful to workers as, um, as people suppose, and to kind of be beset by the same kinds of austerity trends 
as other um, uh, uh, worker protection and worker security programs or broader welfare programs in the economy. Now, the book I've written isn't only a criticism of the automation discourse, it's also in many ways inspired by it because um, I find the vision of post-scarcity that automation theorists kind of lay out in their works and in their visions to be something that we should really think about. They're talking about a world where people, um, where people don't have to work at all or very much, where work is no longer so central to people's lives, the everyday concern and worry about how am I gonna make a living? How am I going to be able to survive disappears? Um, and that's because uh, due to the trends they're describing, they think we can live in a world where we can meet everybody's needs um, very easily and that people will just, yeah, not have to worry about that anymore. And that people will therefore be free to explore their lives, explore the boundaries of what it is to be a human being in all of these exciting ways. Um, and I guess that in my view, uh, the, the problem with this account is not that that vision that they offer, but that they really base it in this, um, in the dream of a qualitative breakthrough to automation. That is to say that their vision of post-scarcity is so founded on their belief in these kinds of um, breakthrough technologies coming into existence. Um, but we don't have to have that idea. We don't have to have such a technologically determinist account of the better world that's on the other side of capitalism. And what I look at in the book is a long alternative tradition, an alternative way of thinking about post-scarcity that's been around for a very long time. That goes all the way back to, in my view, Thomas More, but also thinkers like Marx and Kropotkin and W.E.B. Du Bois and the IWW, all of these different groups that didn't think that we had to wait around for some technological breakthrough that would come in the future they thought instead that given the technologies we already have, we could start to create this post-scarcity world. And we would get there not through new technologies that would only come in the future, but rather through reorganizing and redistributing the work that remains to be done so that everyone has this responsibility to work, but works less, um, with, of course, allowances made for those who can't work. And this shared work, this reorganization of work, making possible a world in which we freely um, give goods and services to meet people's needs and raise them out of scarcity and provide them with a much greater and more substantial freedom than what they have in a capitalist society. Um, now, to get to this world of post-scarcity, again, we don't need to wait around for um, some clever new technology to save us. It's really that what it requires is a break with the, uh, the present day organization of society. It requires a break with the stranglehold that very few wealthy people have in making decisions about um, whether the economy grows or shrinks. It's this threat that capital has that is the main blockage to our um, acceding to a post-scarcity world. Uh, and so what we need to do, in my view, is really to democratize the economy in order to start pressing forward towards this post-scarcity possibility. Um, and a lot of that for me has to do with the, the idea that we can use the technologies that have appeared, these amazing uh, information and communication technologies, which are today being used to surveil workers and to gamify their work in ways that um, uh, really like um, uh, uh, fasten them to their work and make them very insecure. We can use those technologies for other purposes, not as some people think to replace human decision-making, but really to um, broaden it and make it more democratic and use these technologies to um, make decisions both more inclusive and more effective and efficient. And in the book, um, I mentioned this and I'm working on this a lot uh, in a next book project. I think we can think in terms of using algorithms and protocols and reorganizing uh, the economy to really make this kind of inclusive and um, multi-criteria decision-making process uh, that would that would that would be a much better alternative to capitalism in terms of enabling us to meet our many-sided needs and to discover what those are and expand and improve the way that we meet them over time. Um, so this is just again like a very brief introduction to the book. Um, just talking about uh, 
the way that, in my view, you know, that we are living in a really catastrophic situation, especially facing climate change, facing the incredible power imbalances in our economy and the very dark directions that things seem to be going in. But, um, you know, we can, with automation theorists, though, thinking in a very different direction than them, see a way out, a way to slip out of um, the bad timeline that we're in and push forward and fight for a different world. It's just that uh, technology isn't going to be the thing that gets us there. We're going to have to dream big ourselves and fight um, to make that other world. So that's just, again, a very brief introduction to some of the, the themes of the book. And um, uh, yeah, I'll turn it back over to you to, uh, to, for, for questions and comments. So thank you so much. And sorry again that I couldn't be there in person. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron. Um, can we have a round of applause for Aaron first? Or? So I will kick it off with uh, a couple of questions and then open it up to the audience. I can already see some hands in the air, so I, you can expect uh, quite a few. I want to, um, in a way, begin at the point you ended about thinking uh, about a post-scarcity uh, imaginary or hopefully uh, a reality. Um, first, I'd like to draw um, this audience's attention if you haven't uh, read, read his book, in, particularly in chapter six, he has this um, interesting quotation, which, uh, a, a short one, which, uh, which I'll read, where he talks about um, how technology can be used for basically human self-determination rather than just for the interest of a particular capitalist class. And he talks about um, using digital technologies to coordinate the needs and activities by uh, designing algorithms which process data and present alternatives and protocols which structure decisions about alternatives that could be further modified and adapted over time in light of experience. Individuals would have to be able to use applica digital applications to articulate their needs and to transmit these to associations, while associations in turn would need to be able to both allocate resources among themselves and to figure out how to make to do with the resources they're able to acquire in a way that was fair and rational. So within these couple of sentences, there's a lot uh, packed in. Um, my first question would be about how you imagine um, you know, what are the particular applications and protocols that you sort of had in the back of mm -hmm. your mind when thinking about this allocation between the individual and the associations? Um, and, you know, what kind of resources that uh, you were particularly concerned with and you think are particularly important in this space? So that's the, the first question, basically, as an elaboration on this very um, important passage. And the second one, is more less, less about the technology and more about uh, the type of association you had in mind. So in that chapter, you talk a lot about uh, voluntary, voluntary associations. And you note that you know, there should be these sorts of voluntary associations across the globe. And you present a sort of federated uh, structure for these uh, associations. And I was curious what your thoughts are about cooperatives uh, being a type of that association, because on the one hand, yes, they are um, ideally open and voluntary associations, but uh, on the other hand, uh, they have features that are um, more like traditional businesses as well, because they're still usually co competing in a particular type of economy, um, they uh, are operating in a certain type of market, so they're not um, like a pure voluntary association as they might be understood. So I'm curious about these uh, two dimensions. Um, would you like to respond to that first, and then uh, I, yeah. I'll, you know, uh, hand it over to the to the uh, to the floor? Great. Yeah. I mean, these are very expansive questions, and um, I can only begin to answer them here. I think that one really important um, influence on me was reading about, uh, as it were, the kind of worker-owned um, businesses in Yugoslavia in the 1950s and 60s, really in the heyday of this mass experiment in worker-owned enterprises. Um, I think that something that you saw in that environment was that um, 
workers had many different concerns. Like when workers run their own uh, workplaces, there's all sorts of things that they care about. They care about their own working conditions. They care about um, the environmental sustainability of what they're doing. They care about the purpose of their work, like whether their work is actually helping people or not. Um, and they also care about the efficiency and you know orderliness of the projects that they're involved in. Um, but what they found in Yugoslavia was that because the firms they were working in had to remain profit oriented, they had to focus on, you know, making the highest possible returns and optimizing, which is really, I think, a key concept, optimizing their production process for competition. Many of the concerns that workers had just couldn't be addressed because they would actually detract from um, the competitive um, uh, efficiencies of the firms that they worked for. And what happened, according to some historians of the Yugoslavian case, is that as a result, many workers kind of stepped back from uh, involvement in the management of their own enterprises because the kinds of things that they cared about could not be incorporated into the optimization framework that the that these worker-owned firms were operating under. And I think that there's a really big lesson for us there because I think that, um, to me, what's possible in a post-capitalist world where we loosen and kind of remove this in the end, really important that we remove this profitability constraint is that firms are able to, worker-owned firms or worker-owned you know, establishments are able to think in a more multi-criteria way. They're able to kind of think about how they would transform their workplaces along these different dimensions to improve their own satisfaction at work, to improve sustainability, to improve the sense that their work is actually meeting some purpose that's real and actually effectively serves their communities, as well as working to um, make their uh, work efficient and you know, saving on both labor and other resources. And my sense of, when I speak about algorithms and protocols, I'm really talking about that. Because, and here, you know, it's a kind of a technical point, and I'll try to make it very briefly. When you optimize, you really need to focus on a single variable. That's why when, you know, when firms are profit oriented, they have to focus on reducing costs and expanding revenue, right? Producing as much profit per unit as they can. That kind of single unit focus um, is what allows a kind of simple optimization process to unfold across the economy that generates all of these social costs that that process doesn't take into account. Not only the things we're talking about lately, like environmental costs, but also massive costs in terms of like how workers actually feel about their work, how much trust there is in society, all of these other things get left out as social costs. And in my view, a post-capitalist economy would be able to use, would be able to bring these multiple criteria into play, both in the workplace and in society at large. The problem is that when you try to optimize on multiple criteria at the same time, you don't arrive at single technical or economic solutions. Instead, every aspect of the economy is going to have multiple possible directions it can go in. And that, um, that lack of like a single solution, the fact that there are multiple possible directions we can go in, means that these apparently, what are in capitalist economies, very technical and economic decisions, become political and ethical and social. And it's the way that we kind of um, use algorithms to kind of reduce our options while taking into account these different criteria that really matter to us, uh, and then use a democratic procedure to choose you know, how to balance and trade off against the different things that we care about. In a sense, that's the algorithm protocol division I'm thinking of. And it really has to do with the, um, the problems and possibilities of what is sometimes called multi-criteria optimization, goal programming. I think that there's a lot of um, technical stuff here that we can really rely on that people have already done, but the possibilities of incorporating it into the way that we run our workplaces and make investment decisions um, is the possibility of a world without these social costs that actually takes into account and develops the multi-sided needs and possibilities that humans have that are just constrained and kind of um, blocked by uh, capitalism, by the profit motive, by uh, the kind of like strictures and straitjackets of a money economy. So there's a lot more to say there, but um, 
that idea of, of, of being able to um, develop down multiple paths at once and using technologies to kind of frame and organize that process is really something I'm working on in my next book. Th thank you very um, much. Just very Aaron. briefly. Yeah, no, thank you so uh, yeah, much. I, 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 we have um, some questions in the audience. Um, oh, okay, go ahead, yeah. So, so we, we will start with him. Um, maybe we get two or three at once. Um, is there anyone else who has questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I c actually, I do have two questions. So Aaron started one. Uh, what I sorry, I didn't read the book, so I'm just going through what you have said uh, right now. Uh, so uh, the first question is: Okay, um, is this an alternative, like the cooperatives as an association, is an alternative, but a bit in a broader sense? Actually, what I understand is you're offering some sort of. Uh, if I may, a revolutionary or a policy prescription to be able to change uh, the way we are doing anything in the economy right now. So we do have, like you, you said something about like the changing criteria or having a multi-criteria, but as far as I understood, those criteria are mainly about the targets of the business that we're doing. I mean, like profit-oriented or just like green-oriented. But what about, what would you think about the processes that we are creating within the cooperatives? I'm saying this because uh, I, I use the word policy pres prescription uh, like uh, uh, to, to come this, because while you're offering a new way of organizing, a new way of political way, so do you think that we as cooperatives offer a new political agenda as well uh, uh, while we are conducting our daily life, daily business in terms of governance, in terms of democracy. Yeah, we claim that we do, uh, but how do you see it as a, as, a, as a professor, if I may, like working on that? And the second question is a bit important for me personal and conceptually, that, that the point that you made on the basic income debate, that's, that's very important for me because I haven't thought before the link that you put between the production uh, and the distribution, that's for sure the basic income is like having a more fair distribution. But don't you think that distrib like distributing fairly the surplus that we coming getting out of the capitalist production is also changing the production uh, mechanism? So from where I look, basic income has its own potential to contribute to quote-unquote revolutionary change that you are putting. Uh, I would like to uh, hear more of what you think about that proposition. Thanks a lot. Yeah, th go ahead, Aaron. Maybe if you could briefly address both of these questions. Sure, yeah, and I know we're pressed for time, so I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief. I think that um, cooperatives are doing, you know, in a way, my answer to both questions is similar. So I think cooperatives are doing a lot, um, both changing people's lives directly, giving uh, you know, giving real explorations of alternatives and ways of organizing at the you know the smallest level um, that are really important for the broader society. And I think those experiments and the real, not just as experiments, but as real changes in people's lives matter a ton. I think that the the thing is that that has to be combined with a kind of that micro perspective, as, as it were, not necessarily micro in the size of the enterprises, but in the economic sense of being about single firms um, or even sets of firms needs to be combined with a macro perspective, right? And that I think there you see that, um, I think some of the limits of the basic income story to affect change there. Uh, I think that, you know, how would I get at this quickly? I think that in the broader society, we're starting to see a big change, and I think people should pay a lot of attention to this. It used to be the case that people thought that we could fix the, you know, the climate crisis with carbon taxes, that all we needed to do was like change the way that consumers uh, experience the prices of carbon, and then the economy would like reorganize on the back end to take account of that. Many people on the left never thought that was true, but it was a big idea in society. And what we're seeing now is the sense that no, the changes we have to make are just much larger. They involve um, planning, they involve coordination of activity, and they require, especially in an economy that has like 
basically zero interest rates, just massive amounts of spending and borrowing in real infrastructural terms to um, meet people's needs without relying on fossil fuels. And that's the kind of, I think that with basic income, basic income is a similarly too small story about how we're going to like make little adjustments to the market to improve people's lives. It would improve people's lives. There's no doubt about it. It's much better than means-tested programs. But it's not going to be the thing that does this big change that we need. And I think that what we're going to start seeing is more people on the left, and whether they're revolutionary, rah-rah, or fighting for reforms, taking this larger macroeconomic perspective of the need to kind of, um, especially with massive public investment that's not on a profit criteria, start to do this transformation of the economy. That's at once a climate transformation, a transformation in people's experience of work and of distribution at the same time. And I, I guess that's what I would just start to say. We can open up towards this larger perspective that's really about transforming investment, not only earnings for workers, but really transforming the whole uh, organization of investment to not be um, so much based on private profit. So I, that's the, just the beginning of an answer Thank to a so really, really important for, set of questions. I, I think that's a really great uh, point to sort of end uh, this session on. I know that there is there are probably many more questions that people are now thinking about as well based on what you just said and your presentation. Uh, I'd like to again um, you know, offer a round of applause for Aaron for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you so much for such a stimulating discussion, even within a very constrained period of time. Thanks for having me. So uh, really great to, to talk to you all, and uh, I wish you all the best. I'm sorry I couldn't be there for the conference, but I wish everyone the best for, for the rest of the sessions.